Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 to 16. God is the beginning. God is the beginning. God is the beginning. God is the beginning. Um, certainly, uh, in many places, uh, God is described to be the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Uh, John 1, uh, verse 2 says God is, verse 1 and on 2, he was in the beginning, um, for he is the beginning. Colossians 1.17 says he's the beginning of creation. So God is the beginning because he's the beginning of first time, uh, which also means he's the beginning of creation. So that makes him the beginning. So if we believe that God is the beginning, again, the beginning of time and the beginning of creation, our faith uh, means to see the end through the beginning. If we, if we know the beginning, uh, we know the end. Anything that has a beginning will have an end. So um, today uh, we're going to focus on his attribute as, of, uh, as the beginning, uh, but we also need to understand with the beginning, he's the end, that he puts end to what he began. So our faith is to know that all things will come to end by the one who began. And faith life, therefore, is to forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead and pressing on to take hold of it, as we just read. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead to press on to take hold of it. That's what Christian life is about. That's what faith life is about. Does that sound good as you begin the new year? to say, I'm going to forget about what is behind and I'm going to strain toward what is ahead. Yes, it does sound good. We want to forget about the last year um, of overeating, perhaps, and uh, over resting and over, you know, um, you name it, you know, whatever, oversleeping and, you know, lack of this and that. And as you begin a new year, that you, you have new resolution, new goal, and new outlook. Um, but as I said, uh, unfortunately, this thing called new year resol uh, uh, a New Year resolution really doesn't last long enough to keep that determination uh, continue throughout the year. That's why it's called New Year resolution, right? And um, it is so quick to dissolve, even though we get so excited about you know, a new beginning, a new hope. Um, you know, a, a businessman who, who fails uh, looks forward to a new beginning. Uh, or somebody who uh, comes from, you know, who goes through many broken relationships, whether with their family or love, romantic relationship, they would look forward to new relationship, new opportunity. Um, and for certainly pe people who uh, have been in prison and inca incarcerated for many years, like, you know, decades, 20, 30, they come out of prison looking for a new opportunity, uh, new hope. But the reality in life is that past is very difficult to overcome. Um, and because of the past, there's a saying, the past comes back to haunt you, right? Um, it's an interesting thing. We are like time machines. We have a beginning. Our bodies have a beginning and end. Uh, we know certainly when we began by knowing our birth dates. Um, and we live each day, one day at a time. So we live only a moment at a time. We only know a moment at a time. That's what makes us human. It makes us very vulnerable and limited in our knowledge, in our power, in our existence. So we're only a moment. But when those moments add up, they become past. Okay? So we know how to look back. But because we only live a moment, we don't know what's coming ahead. Isn't that interesting? All we know is the past, because we live a moment at a time. And when you accumulate these, these moments, they are their past. And therefore, it's human nature to you know, think about the past and get um, impacted by the past. So trauma, right? for example, people who are tra uh, traumatized, uh, both physically and psychologically, um, have uh, 
side effects or uh, your lifetime struggle to overcome that trauma because the past carries on. The past shapes who they are in terms of how they see things, how they re establish relationship with people, how they make decisions. All these things are shaped by their past. So, you know, when you go, uh, when, you know, someone goes to a doctor's office for some medical, phys you know, physiological, you know, issues, they take, um, the doctor takes what? Medical history, medical history. So they ask for your history and even your father's, your mother's history because the history has some impact and actually a lot of impact on your future, right? And, and almost like determination. So that's definitely a case for physical, uh, but also psychological. So uh, when people go see therapists or psychiatrists, uh, they definitely, you know, when people lie down, what do they talk about? They talk about what happened when they were a child, like childhood, because the childhood experience carries them on throughout their life. So what happens is that when they don't have pretty past, they have um, negative past, dark past, it comes back to haunt them and actually sticks with them and even uh, causes their current uh, problems like anxiety and depression. It's because they have no ability, no power to overcome the past, to shake the past, right? Because we don't have the power. It's easy to fall into the past and dwell in the past, but we don't have the power to shake off the past. So that's what makes uh, man miserable. This is the misery of uh, the human life. We don't have the power to be set free uh, from our past. Certainly not everyone is haunted by the past, but um, many people struggle uh, because of their past. Now compare that to God who is the beginning of time and creation. Meaning, if he is the beginning of time, he was always there even before time began. We tend to think time is like this abstract thing. You know, we look at the clock or the watch and we can tell what time it is. But time as a concept seems very abstract. But time and space, you, you ask a cosmologist or physicist, is the same. So uh, Stephen Hawking wrote a book called Brief History of Time because time has history. So time began when the world began. So this beginning, the Bible certainly talks about before Stephen Hawking, be Hawking's and be even before Albert Einstein. Uh, it, it, and in fact, the beginning of the Bible starts with the beginning. So let's go to Genesis 1.1. Hopefully, COJ members have moved beyond Genesis 1.1 as of today. Right? Genesis 1.1. Ready? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the beginning of the Bible starts with the phrase, in the beginning. So in the beginning, what happens in this beginning? God created the heavens and the earth. So this is how the Bible begins. The Bible begins that the world came about by God. God made the world. He is the maker of the world. He began the world. He began time. So time came when the world came. So that's Genesis 1.1. So that's one place you'll find this phrase in the beginning. There is another place in the Bible that has the same phrase in the the beginning, which is not in Genesis, but actually it's much, much further away from Genesis. It's in John. Let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. This is a really different beginning. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that is, if you will, like you learn in geometry, you put a point and you start to run a line from it, right? So with an arrow. So it's a one line. So that's sort of the starting point. Genesis 1, 1 is starting, the starting point of all creation, the starting point of time. That's what the beginning is. But when you look at John, this is a different type of beginning. This beginning... He's talking about something else. This beginning was not when the world was made, but this is when the word was, uh, was. And the word was with God. The word there you notice in English is capitalized. In Greek, it's ho logos. Altogether, ho logos, the word. And ho logos means the self-manifestation of God. So you're learning three things. So the word in Greek is 
whole logos in plain words what does it mean the self manifestation of god so this is the way god reveals himself because without god revealing himself there is no way for creation to know him creation like men to know him because he's too great so this beginning was the moment moment when god decided to reveal himself as the word whole logos and this beginning was before the beginning of Genesis 1-1. Did I get you interested in reading the Bible yet? Because even though Genesis is the beginning of the Bible, it does not mean that it's going in a straight line. Yeah? So John 1, which is in the New Testament, is actually talking about a time, and I'm going to put in quotation, time that is before, beyond the beginning of the world, beginning of the creation. So this was when the word was with God in the beginning. So there was the word, there was God. There is God, and there is the word with him. So the word is this person with God, a distinct person with God in the beginning. So we're going to call this beginning an eternal time. Eternal time. So eternal time, which is contradictory, right? Eternal time, that's why I'm putting quotation. Eternal means what? Didn't we go over this? Eternal means what? There is? No time. Eternal doesn't mean long, long, long. Like, oh my God, this worship is so long. Their service is so long. I told you, I, I told the logo students last night, you should be thanking the Lord that I, we don't preach for six hours or all night like Paul did. You know, the apostle Paul preached so many hours that people actually, there was a guy who fell off upper room and died. <laughs> who knows? Wait, if the Holy Spirit inspires us, maybe one day, maybe one day. But as of now, now I got everyone's attention. They're all awake. Like, if I fall asleep now, I may die. Okay. <laughs> so if you don't pay attention, you only hear the end. That's all you're going to walk out with. If I fall asleep, I may die. Okay. So through, and it is he, the word, who was with God in the beginning. So this is the eternal time. So there is no time in eternity, but this is the moment outside of that dot that I just talked about in Genesis 1.1. Now, if you were to go back to, uh, Genesis 1 1. What happens in Genesis 1, chapter 1? This is the creation of the world. The first creation God makes was what? What was the first creation? He said, Let there be light, and that light came. So, with light, uh, we have this thing called time frame uh, six days. So, God creates the world in six days. Now, scientists say that doesn't make sense, therefore creation is, is wrong, because six days, if you were to calculate that, that would make the universe today about 6,000 plus or maybe 7,000 years old. We know that the universe is much, much older than that. It's like billion years old. So that's not correct. We, nobody said that one day, that where it says it was beginning, it was night, and it was day, and it was the first day. It was day one. It was begin. It was night, and it was uh, morning, and it was the second day. So where it says that doesn't mean that one day was 24-hour system. Right? So we don't uh, we don't know, and it probably was not uh, of 24-hour system for many days. But this time cutoff point called day, each day, begins with the creation of the light. So once the light comes, then that day is called day one, first day, and then second day, the expanse, the firmament. The space is made, and that's the second day. And the third day, well, it's made, the earth, the land. So that is then third day. So there's frame each day, fourth day, the stars and the, the sun. Probably that's when the 24-hour system came about. The sun and the moon, the solar system, and uh, the earth's rotation it created night and day, a uh, 24-hour uh, uh, system, and seasons and all that. So. Um, whether it was 24 hours, it's not that important, but this cutoff from beginning and end of a day came about with light. So light became past, the firmament became past, earth became past after at the end of each day of creation. Now God created for those six days and he stopped. On the seventh day, he did not create anymore. On the seventh day, what did he do? Let's go to Genesis 2, verses 2 to 3. 
By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So on the seventh day, he does something entirely different. He doesn't work. What was his work for six days? He didn't go to work, like, you know, go to work, like go to a job. What was his work for six days? Creation. Yes, it was God's work. He's the creator. His work was the creation, all things. But on the seventh day, he didn't work. He blessed the day. And what was the result of the blessing? It became holy. And then what did he do when it, once it was made holy? He entered his rest. So for him to enter his rest, he had to bless it and make it holy. Made it a restful environment for God to enter. And once he entered, all the work that he had done in the six days of the past became all his. He began, became the beginning of all the creation he worked for for six days. He became the owner, the creator, the beginning of all things. So seventh day, he entered the rest. Now, what kind of rest was that? His eternal rest is something without regret. He does not look back from it because it's perfect and it's eternal. It has no time. That's what his rest is like. How many of you want God's rest? Amen. I know some of us, we just want to sleep all day, right? Like one day. One day, I wish I could sleep all I want. But, you know, if, they ever, if that ever happens, maybe, like the day after Zoe, like let's say you do that. And <laughs> we let you rest that day. So you sleep. But what happens if you sleep and sleep and sleep? First, you have a backache because you've been lying down for so long, and you're so tired because you've been sleeping so many hours, right? So you need to rest more, you know? <laughs> My daughter was telling me, her friend, they're 10 years old, and the girl, her, her friend told her, I love sleeping. And there was like, Mom, she tells me she loves sleeping. What kind of kid likes sleeping? You know? <laughs> I said, well, except you, everybody likes to sleep. So <laughs> very difficult child. But she said, you know, her friend really likes to sleep. She's like, if I have time, I will sleep all day. That's what her friend told her. So, yeah, I guess even a kid needs rest, so she wants to rest all, 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 all hours of the day. But what happens in reality is that you need rest from rest. And people say, I need a vacation from vacation. No rest in this world is perfect. However, the rest that God entered is perfect. It is eternal. It is holy. Therefore, it is set apart from any other forms of rest in this world. And that's the kind of rest God wants to give us. Hallelujah. For, for that, he made man to be a living being. So in that same chapter 2, verse 7, God breathed into man who's made from the dust of the ground his breath of life and made, a man, made the man a living being. And the living being is a spiritual being living in the flesh. Spiritual being means an infinite being. It has beginning because it came from God. But it has no end as like our flesh does. Our flesh is finite. It has beginning and end. But as I tell you all the time, remind you, you shouldn't find out when that end is or you should not try to make it happen either. Get what I'm saying? Okay. So we, have, we know the beginning, but we don't know when we're going to end. But we do know that our body's going to end. However, the spirit that's inside the body of man, it has beginning with God, from God, by God but has no end. It lives infinitely because it's spiritual. Infinitely, I say, because it either lives with God, like God, in eternal life, or in eternal condemnation in the fire of hell forever. So it's one or the other. So that's to exist infinitely. God made man to be a living being. Now, this, this man, that one beginning of all mankind, his name is Adam, and Adam means living being. So he lived in the Garden of Eden where he was given the word of God to live by, which was to obey the word of God. And the word that came to Adam was to not eat from the one tree that was at the center that was called the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God warned him, if you eat it, you will surely die. And God spoke to the spirit inside his flesh, meaning if the spirit disobey, the spirit will die. And he did disobey because he was deceived by a serpent in Genesis chapter 3. And serpent, we find out in Revelation 12, 7 on, that it was an ancient serpent, the devil. So devil, the devil came in the form of serpent and tempted the man to be like God by taking this forbidden fruit. 
But instead of becoming like God, the man sinned, became broken away from God, separated from God, separated from the beginning of time, the beginning of all creation, the life that he has, the rest he wants to give, the man will have no more because he's now cast out from the, the Garden of Eden. Now, immediately after sin, however, what Adam did and, and for, he did for his wife Eve, who came from his body, um, who also shared his spirit, was to make covering for themselves because the, the sin that commit, they committed made them conscious of their nakedness. They, they feared and they became afraid uh, and ashamed, so they covered themselves with uh, fig leaves. So their covering was made of fig leaves. When God was driving them out of the garden, what God does that's significant for us to pay attention to in Genesis, at the end of Genesis 3 is that God took the covering of fig leaves off of them and clothed them with what he himself made, which was made of skin, the garments of skin. I really do hope that you read that part because it's in Genesis 3. It's very, very close from the beginning. You just keep reading and you'll get there. So the garment of skin is God providing this way of covering man. So what can that be? Covering our past. You have covered all my sin, like the, sin, the song that we sang. You have covered all my sin. You have covered all my past. So God had planned, because he's the beginning, to cover the past, the shameful, sinful past of men. And we see a glimpse of that way in the beginning of time in Genesis uh, 3. And according to that, God, uh, according to who he is and his plan, God began to uh, reveal himself uh, uh, through uh, a man's life. And we begin with um, the sons of Adam outside the garden. Cain, uh, who was the first son of Adam and Eve, kills his younger brother Abel because of um, jealousy. You know, his sacrifice is not received, but Abel's is received by God. Uh, he's, he's jealous, and he kills his brother with his own hands. And uh, immediately, he becomes afraid for his life. So then he asks God, and he pleads with God and said, Please, I cannot bear this guilt that I have. You know, like Lady Macbeth, out damn spat out, like constantly washing her hands out of the consciousness of sin. He, he hears the voice of his brother crying out, Brother, you kill me. Now you can imagine. So the outcry of his brother's blood, he was haunted by the guilt uh, and the shame. And he also said, I'm afraid that other, when others see me, they're going to kill me too. So when he pleaded to God, God didn't say, well, good luck. You deserve it. But what did God do? He gave him the mark of salvation. So he gave him this mark to protect him because Cain pleaded to God for his life. Later on, God called on a man named Abraham. Um, and when God, was, when God called him in Genesis 12, Abraham was living in uh, the place that's the current Iraq, because he's from the Mesopotamia area. And God commanded in verse 1 of Genesis 12 to leave his country and his father's household and to go a place that he instructed him to go, the land that he showed him, which is the, the land of Canaan, which was the, on the other side of the river. So following God's instruction, showing him the way, Abraham left everything that he knew, his past, and marched into the water, crossed the river, and start new by following God's word. He did not know where he was going, but he followed him in faith and obedience. So with the crossing of the river, <coughs> river <coughs> he earns the nickname Ibri. Ibri, uh, in Hebrew, Ibri, or Ibru, is someone who crosses river. So you can guess Ibru, Ibru means, or it comes to mean today, Hebrew. So the Hebrews, the Hebrew people, the Hebrew language, has origin in this word, crossing river, coming uh, from the, the other side to this side. Okay? So from the past into new future, new beginning. So what happens? Then Abraham receives this blessing, and it comes true to become the father of many nations, the father of the Hebrews, uh, having many descendants come from him. He becomes the ancestor of the Jews. 
compare that or contrast that with somebody like Lot's wife. Lot's wife. Anyone know her name? You know her name? I don't know her name. I don't know how you know your name. I, let me tell me what her name is because I don't know her name. Somebody said, <laughs> "Really? I, I don't." It says I don't have. Um, so anyway, Genesis 19. Um, maybe I didn't pay attention, but it's not important. Her her name. There are a lot of wives whose name, or even sons, that they, they don't. <laughs> they're very confident. I don't know what they were thinking, but anyway. So Lot's wife. Um, Lot's wife is Lot's wife. Her name is not mentioned. It's not important, so we don't call her by her name. But Lot's wife is known to be what? What is she known? For? What is she famous for? Anybody? She became a pillar of salt. That's all you need to know about her. Because many of you are going like, maybe I should go on Wikipedia and find out what her name is. Uh, Lot's wife. Lot was a nephew of Abraham who lived in Sodom, and God said to him through the angels who came to his home and said. I'm going to rain down brimstone fire to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, for they are filled with wickedness, so you better flee for your lives. So God told this to Lot in his household, which included his wife, his daughters, and the sons-in-laws, to all run out. But in this, uh, the reaction was the sons-in-laws laughed at that. Like, are you kidding me? We're not going. No, it's no fire. It was going to start at the next day, so nothing was happening at the night or even in the early at, at the crack of dawn. It wasn't starting yet because God had made a deal with um, Lot only when he reached the city uh, called uh, Zor, then the uh, brimstone fire would come down. So until then, God would hold off the fire. So by the time they had to leave, there was no fire, so nobody believed it, including the neighbors, including the sons-in-law, so they didn't go. But... Lot and his wife and the two daughters left. But what was the word that they were given? They had to obey. They had to run, run for their life. And while they're running, what must they not do? Turn back. Must not look back, must not turn back. So that was the word that they were given, and, and they listened to that. So they, they followed a, uh, Lot, the father, the husband, and the daughters. They were all on their journey to this little city. They had to climb the mountains and hills to get there to avoid this destruction. So they started off all together, but Lot's wife, she turned back. Why? Because she was thinking, oh, but, but that's the city that I love. All the good things that I stored up, my savings, my investment, my friends, my dream, my plan, all my childhood, my past, I want to see what's going on. And she turned back. Then there was no more voice, no more breath from her body. She turned into a pillar of salt. But Lot and his daughters continued their journey and made it to the city uh, and from then on, they watch the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah burn down to ashes. So what's the lesson from Lot's wife? She was not to look back, but only to look forward to God, according to God's instruction, but she disobeyed. So this was the lesson that the people of Israel knew. They studied this, they heard this over and over again, and they were the people that God brought out from their slavery in Egypt by Moses. Now, when they were slaves in Egypt, how many years were they, uh, were they there for? They were there for 430 years. For 430 years, for four generations, their status in Egypt was that they were slaves. So when Moses went in there and said, let my people go to the Pharaoh and let the people out after the 10 plagues that took place, they were leaving behind their slavery, the past of their slavery for four generations, and to bury that for good, they had to first go through this passage. What's the passage that I'm talking about? As soon as they left Egypt, they had to go through the Red Sea. So the Bible says they were baptized into Moses in the Red Sea, meaning they had to walk through the Red Sea like dry land. They bury their past. You see why Corinthians talks about their, their crossing as baptism is because it correlates to our baptism today in its name, to bury the past. And their past was of their slavery to a worldly leader, a world leader called the Pharaoh. And then once they came out of the Red Sea, their identity became the people of God, and they followed the pillar of fire by the night, the pillar of clouds by the day. They followed Moses and his staff standing before them, walking before them, following the word. 
through the life in the desert. Now, how many years did they live in the desert for? How many people survived the 40-year desert? How many people left the, de uh, the slavery anyway? About 2 million altogether. And two, about 2 million people, young and old, women and children, men, all of them together, about 2 million left. But in the desert, all but two fell on their faces and died. Was it just the two who entered the promised land? No, there were a new generation, but only the two who left Egypt entered, Joshua and Caleb. What happened to the rest? Why did they die? If God is loving and he wants to give them the blessing of the promised land, why did they let them die? Why did he kill them? Why? Because they looked back to Egypt. <coughs> they said, as soon as the road became tough, they said, Moses, you brought us out to kill us when they ran out of water. You brought us out to kill us when they ran out of bread. You brought us to kill us, brought, out, brought us out here to kill us. We want to go back. We want to go back to Egypt because we're running out of protein. We want the meat. You know, at least even as slaves, we ate the meat that they had. Some of you are thinking, meat, yes, that's what I need right now. <laughs> we ate garlic. We had leeks. We had watermelon. We had all the good stuff in Egypt. Yeah, we were slaves, but at least we had good food. That's why the Bible always says, don't let your stomach be your God, right? But these people were saying, we want to go back to Egypt. So when they did look back, they didn't turn back to, they didn't turn to solar pillars of salt, but they fell on their faces and died. To remind them this, year after year for generations, what did God tell them to build? The sanctuary in the desert. And in the sanctuary was where, uh, what, was, what was kept inside? The tabernacle, inside the tabernacle was the Ark of the Testimony. Inside of it was the stone tablets, the law. The law that reminded them of what God wanted them to do, right? obey, and which was the guidance of also obedience and disobedience. If you broke it, you disobey. If you obey, then you can live. So the law was the law that bound them to the past because what the law did was to remind them of their sin. You did this, you did this, you're a sinner. So the law was a reminder of their sin. The, the law was a reminder of their past. It bound them to the past. So Hebrews 10, 1 to 4 talks about that. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So according to the law, they knew that they were sinners, that they had committed sin in the past, like yesterday or just this morning. The law would tell them. And when they become conscious and guilty, what do they do? According to the same law, they would give sacrifice. Now, when they, where they gave the sacrifice was the sanctuary. Now, if that sacrifice, which involved the blood of animals, washed, cleansed them perfectly, would they still feel guilty about what they, de they, they did last week, what they did that whole year? No. It was actually a reminder of their sin every year because it was not perfect. Because it was not a perfect place. It was not done by perfect uh, mediator. It was not done by perfect sacrifice but it was only a copy, a shadow of the true thing to come in the future. So according to the prophecy, the Son of God, Yeshua, Jesus, came and walked by the same temple, later becoming the temple of Jerusalem. What did he say? He said, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it again in three days. What was he talking about? There you go, the temple of his body. Remember what the temple has. The temple has the law that... Bind the bound, the temple, the physical temple had the law that bound sinners to the past. It was also the same place sacrifice was given, but because it was not perfect, it reminded them of the past. But here's Yeshua coming as a temple of God in the flesh to make it perfect. By tearing it down, he's saying, I'm going to put an end to time. I'm going to put an end to your past. Because you are sinners bound to your past, sins of your past, and your slavery to the devil, the origin of sin of the past. This is all because of the fact that you are in time. So what he's saying is, if you kill me, 
I'm going to die because men will kill me, but this is according to God's plan, his schedule. When my flesh is put to an end, time would be put to an end. Your past would be put to an end. And now I will give you a new beginning because he is the God who came in the flesh. And who is God? God is the beginning, the beginning of time, the beginning of creation. And that's why he said, that's what we read in John 1, 1 in the beginning, saying that he was the word who was with God in the beginning. And what does 1, 3 say? Quickly go back to John 1, 1, 3. One, three. So why don't we read the whole thing again? One, two, one, three. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So who was with God in the beginning? The Word. But the Word was God, right? So we're talking about the essence of God. And this Word in his essence is God, his deity, right? But he's a distinct person from the Father God in the beginning. Verse 3, through him, who are we still talking about? Through whom? Through the word. Through him, all things were made. So what it's saying is, through the word, all things were made. But then it kind of repeats itself in a little bit differently. Through him, all things were made, and it says, without him, nothing was made that has been made. So it says, through him, all things were made. So the creator, creator of the world we know as God, but specifically who made the world? It was the Word who was with God. But then it repeats in the second phrase, without him, nothing was made that has been made. So what does that mean? Without him, nothing was made that was made. What that's highlighting is he was not made. The one who made the world was not made. The, wor the one who made time was not in time was outside time. He always was. The Bible says Jesus, who, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, who was and is and is to come. Because he's the beginning of all things, all creation, time. He's outside. And the word was outside. The word who made the world was not made. He's the uncreated one. And then, what happened to the word in verse 14? The Word, verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. He dwelt among us men. Who is that? That is the Son of God coming in the name of Yeshua. The Hebrew name Yeshua, which is the Savior, God with us, Emmanuel. It is He who is outside of time. That's why when He came in the flesh, He came in this purpose with this purpose and mission of ending his flesh and ending time that began with him he is the beginner beginning of time and by putting his flesh to death he will end time and this concept of past that comes to haunt us because of sin because of the fact that we're sinners and that's why he also said in john 8 32 you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Set you free from what? Well, let's see. Logo said, set me free from the law of sin and death, and the, the law of nature, and the past. To set me free from the past. Because he is the truth. He is the truth. His word is the truth. The word, his word is the law. And by his word, by his law, those who believe in him, they will be set free from the past of their past of sin and death, from their bondage to the devil. So he showed that. Yeshua showed it in his brief time on earth as the Son of God during his ministry years, as he did many, many uh, works of healing. And when he healed, the healing took place as a result of turning the, past, turning the present of sick, being sick, being ill into past. So in John 5, there was a story of a paralytic man 
who had been paralyzed for 38 years. He was lying down in a mat for all those years. So Jesus had compassion on him, knowing how many years of his life he spent. Who knows how old he was? Maybe he was 38 years old, and he's been paralyzed for 38 years. But Jesus commanded him to do what? Pick up? Pick up his mat and walk. And that moment, he believed in the word of Yeshua, and with all his faith and all his strength that he's ever had in his life, he got up, picked up his mat, and walked. Do you believe that? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. So that moment of healing took place because what is his word? His word is the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth set him free, yes, from his paralysis, but the paralysis of his past. So his paralysis of the present moment was turned into past the moment he believed in the word of Yeshua. Hallelujah. Amen. Also in John 9, there was a story of a man who was blind from his birth. Again, we don't know how old the man was. All he wanted to do was see, to see. Jesus commanded him, put a mud on his, face, uh, on his eyes and sent him into the pool of Siloam and told him to go wash. And the moment he washed his eyes out, obeying the word of Jesus, the truth, he opened his eyes and he saw. So his blindness of the present moment became past the moment he believed and obeyed the word of Jesus, which is the truth that turned his present illness into the past. Hallelujah. Yes. But when it came to his own death, Jesus did not perform any miracle because he came with this mission to put an end to time through the death of his flesh. So when he went to the cross and died, what did he say? He said, it is finished. He said, it is finished because it was the moment he was nailing to the cross his flesh. When he nailed his flesh to the cross, it was the moment to end the time that began with the Father, with him in the Father, and saying, Father, you alone are the beginning. Now, he is the one who created the world as the Word, right? But when the Word became flesh, he became like man. He became man. So Jesus is the God who came as man. He came in the flesh of man. So even though he is the infinite God, eternal God, who has no time, he became, he came into time, right? So he has birthday. We just celebrate Christmas, like what's considered his birthday on, in the world. And he also died, death day. So he came, he who has no time came into time in, by coming in the flesh, and this was to proclaim through his death, Father, you alone are the beginning, who is the beginning of time and all things. In your hands are all things. I submit my life into your hands. I commend my soul to you. It is finished. And by doing so, he gave glory to God the Father. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's why Isaiah 44, uh, verse 6 the prophecy said, this is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. And Hebrews 1, 1 to 2 says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times in various ways in the past. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the universe. So in these last days, he spoke to us through the Son. In the past, he spoke to us by the prophets, through the prophets. But in these last day, days, he sent his Son to the world. The God who knows no time became a cre like creature, who know, like who knows time. But it was for him to dwell briefly and taste death briefly to give glory to the Father and say, when he became like time, the only one who knows no time is the Father God. You see, the perfection of of the plan of God for his glory. Hallelujah. And he condemned the devil eternally because the devil was, who was he in the beginning? Well, who, yeah, who is he? Like by nature, what was he made as? An angel, 
Yes, he was an angel, an archangel, who sinned and he became a fallen angel. So he has no flesh. No flesh. So having no flesh means what? You don't have, you can't forget what is behind. Flesh allows us, by the grace of God, to forget what is behind. But angels don't have that. The grace of God does not affect angels. And that is what happened to this fallen angel, the origin of sin, the devil. Jesus condemned him eternally because he has no flesh. He cannot forget what he's behind. And by shedding his precious blood, Jesus buried the sins of men in the past so that whosoever believes can be set free, can taste freedom and be broken away from their bondage to their past, to the devil, to the price of sin, death. Hallelujah. Colossians 2, 13, 14 talks about that. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing to the cross. The written code, he ripped it apart. Written code, what does a written code mean? It's a document of slavery, the law. The law says you are bound. You do this, you're bound. You, owe, you do this, you owe this. Do you understand? That's what the law said. You broke the law, you owe your life. You need to pay it with your life. Burn for burn, tooth for tooth, and eye for eye. Price of sin is all re recorded in the written code, the law. And it says, I own you. That's what the document says. But Jesus, by nailing his flesh to the cross, he nailed the written code to the cross, and he nailed our sins to the cross. The price was paid so that we no longer have to be bound to our past. If it is good news, say amen. amen. So with his shed blood, he gave us new beginning. He allowed us to start new. This new beginning is the new beginning for a new nation, for a new king. Who is the king for this new nation? Yeshua, the Christ. Hallelujah. And what is the law in this new nation? The truth hails as its law. Hallelujah. And who is its people? Who are the people? The people are those who are made new creation, born again in the precious blood of Christ. Hallelujah. That's what happened as the Father raised him up according to the promise in three days from the grave. And Yeshua entered the heavenly throne, heavenly place, and sat on the heavenly throne to reign forever and ever as the beginning and, and the end, the first and the last the king who reigns forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. From that throne came the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit was promised to believers by Yeshua himself. And he called him the Spirit of Truth. What is he called? John 14, 17, John 15, 26, John 16, 13. The Spirit of Truth. When the Spirit of Truth comes, when the Spirit of Truth comes, what does that mean? The spirit of truth means the spirit of the new. The spirit of the new, because he is the spirit that never perishes, never becomes old, always new. You know, new year, you know, you, you look at the people in Times Square who go there, you know, who find their spot at the beginning of the day or even the night before and they wait for the ball to drop and they got those glasses ridiculous silly looking 2016 and they're blowing thing and with the hat and you know basically it's an excuse to get drunk and party and then what next day they, they wake up with headache hangover yeah they, okay I should go to the gym that's what they say yeah so they try it a day or two three Oh, I got to go to work. I have so much to do. I'm going to skip it. Oh, yeah, next year. By February comes, I messed up. Same old, same old. The newness is not always new. Anything in this world, everything in, under the sun, nothing under the sun, in fact, is new. Right? Nothing under the sun is new. However, in the spirit of truth, he gave us chance to start new, start have an eternal beginning, an eternal start, a new start in the name Yeshua. Hallelujah. As Romans 8, 1, 2 says, 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. The devil's got no hold of me. Do you believe that? Because he paid the price, and I believed it. I received his name. I believed in his name. I called on his name, and in his name I have received his precious blood, the blood that is new, eternal, beginning. Do you believe that? Amen. How do you begin then? When you receive his name and start to believe, what is the new beginning of your life as a Christian? It's marked by baptism. So baptism is to bury the old, Romans 6, 6 says. You bury the old self that was crucified with Christ on the cross. You bury the old self so that the body of sin might be done away with because you're no longer slave to sin. You were, but you no longer are. Because when you go in the water, even though it's the same water within a matter of seconds, however, when you come out, you are, you are coming out as new creation. And as you look back, even if it's the same water and you don't see anything else but the water, that's where your old self lies. Your old self who belonged to the devil, who belonged to sin and death. Hopelessness, depression, despair, anxiety, sadness, lack of hope. All of that is buried in the water, in the blood of Christ, at the cross, hanging at the cross. It's not Jesus, but my sin, my old self. And that's how we begin our new journey, this new eternal beginning in Yeshua. Hallelujah. Amen. What else? How else are we set free then? How, what does the spirit of truth allow us to, to, um, to start new? By repenting. What does repentance do? What is repentance? Repentance is not just confession, verbal confession, as some people make it. I'm sorry. Say it like you mean it. Parents know this best. Mommies know best. When the kids say, I'm sorry. Whatever, I'm sorry. That's not sorry, right? If someone really means they're sorry, they will be weeping, and they will be in agony because of their regret of their wrongdoing. So even humans know when somebody means it when they apologize. How much more for God? So when we repent, it has to be painful, a painful, out of a painful conviction uh, and confession. And it involves a resolution, determination to not sin the same. Even if it is the same confession that you made yesterday, Right? You, you did the same thing. Oh, I was lazy. I didn't obey. I didn't preach enough. I didn't pray enough. I didn't love enough. I didn't do this and this. It's like, it's like you heard this yesterday, right, Jesus? Should I do it again? The replay? We have to do it again. Because the moment we confess our sins is when we turn our past sins into past. Otherwise, I live with the guilt. I live with the con consciousness of my past sins. So even though Jesus did pay the price of my sin, I can still have guilt when I break sin to I break uh, the command today. So the way to be free from the guilt and the consciousness is by repenting. And John, 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Is this gospel or not? Amen. So to make us holy, as Ephesians 5, 26 says, cleansing us by the washing with water through the word. When you hear the word, when you read the word, it is not to make yourself feel good or to, to sound wise to people. Some people say, well, I read about Confucius. I read about Buddha. I read about Muhammad. And let me read about Jesus. So it's, I couldn't have a comprehensive you know, knowledge of what these great men said. That's not what the reading the Bible is about. Reading the Bible is about washing ourselves by the word because the word tells us what the truth is and how untruthful we are, untrue we are, how, what kind of liars we are, how deceitful we are, how much dece deceived we are. So before the reflection of the word, we are brought down to tears to confess that we are sinners every day, every day, to turn our sins to past. The third thing that we have to do is pray. Pray. Why do we need to pray? 
because we have problems, folks. I don't know about you, but I have problems. A lot of my problems are your problems, actually. So anything from you not being employed, as I said last night, unemployed, oh, okay. Oh, no. So I have to go pray. <laughs> so it's like, you're okay, we've got to pray. I turn on more things to pray, okay? i got to add on my prayer list, Lord. So-and-so is without a job. They need a job. They need a job so that they can have their steady life and have grow in their faith and continue to serve you. Yeah, we need prayer for everything. Employment, financial needs, and physical needs. So-and-so sick. Oh, no. Okay, I have to pray. Because when I pray, I'm turning my current problem, present problem, into past. Does that mean that I'm free of problem right now? No. I could still be sick. I'm still unemployed. I still have problems. But when I tell it to my Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, I lay in his hand my burden. And when I lay in his hand my burden, now it's not my problem anymore. Whose problem is it? Our Father's problem. Nicole feels so bad. like, our Father's problem. <laughs> But it is. It's his problem. Is this good news? Hallelujah. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I don't have to live with the burden of my problems or your problems. It's his problem. So I have no choice but to pray. I was preparing this word, and this morning, too, I was thinking of the burden of the new year. We start new year with, like, hope and excitement, but at the same time, there's burden burden of responsibilities and the weight of what is coming now what's going to happen this year even though I wanted to put last year behind and I did I buried that in the blood of Yeshua thank the Lord for that that there is this thing called time all the hurtful moments all the hurtful things that I heard all the hurtful things that I might have said right all the mistakes that I made all the shameful moments and all the angry moments, lack of fruit, shame, laziness. If you think about that, and if we dwell in that, it would be better to be dead than live a day, a, a day more like that. But thank God we have this thing called time that he cut off and said, this is past. Now you live this day, aiming for what is ahead. That's why Paul wrote that we have not taken hold of it yet, but we forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead. What is ahead? The eternal rest that is waiting for us in the Father's house. Hallelujah. How many of you want to go there? That's why Hebrews 4.1 says, let us be careful that we don't lose it. Let us make every effort to enter that rest because we have not entered it yet. Yes, we have been saved from our past sins and from the fire of hell. We don't have to go there anymore, but we're not there yet. Until then, we live in this place where we have to work. Still there is suffering. Still there are memories. Still there are problems. That's why the spirit of truth in us, who, make, who is the spirit who never grows old, reminds us. I put your past behind. Now don't worry about the past. Do not dwell in the past, but strain toward what is ahead. So when I think about what is ahead this year, like tomorrow, next week, how are people going to do and what, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? What are they gonna, what, what, how are they going to obey or disobey? What fruit am I going to have? What am I going to not have? What do I have to do? All these things I think about and I go, oh, God, my, my heart feels so heavy. But I think about what is really ahead beyond time, a place where I can live beyond time a place where I can dwell eternally in his eternal peace that never grows old, the joy that never grows old, the gladness that never dies, where there is no sin, no sickness, no sadness, no suffering, no sin, no more death. I want to go there, amen? amen. Until then, we are to put every effort to not dwell in the past, but to strengthen toward what is ahead by praising his name, praying his name, repenting, and clinging unto his name all the days of our lives so that we can enter that eternal rest in that day. Hallelujah. Amen.
Let's pray. This is the good news. There's nothing better than this news to those who suffer from anxiety, stemming from their past, carrying on today and even tomorrow, depression, despair. He set us free from them all so that now we don't dwell in the past, things that grow old in this world, but we can have eternity, the eternal rest that is waiting for us, that is ahead of us, so that we can press on to take hold of it. Let's lift up our hands as we begin the new year. I want to cling unto one thing, and that is this eternal rest you promised for me, that you have put up before me. Let me never let go of it. Let me press on. Yeshua! Yeshua! Father, just yes, help us to are. keep our eyes forward, Father, understanding that you are waiting for us. Let's pray that we will not dwell in our past, the past of our mistakes, our laziness, our lack of fruit, all the mistakes we made in our words and our action, the lack of love we had towards each other, other souls, that we would not dwell in that we would not repeat them, but by the spirit of truth, we will have a new eternal beginning in him. Let's pray. Yeshua! There's a place where the streets shine with the glory of the Lamb. There's a way we can go there, we can live there. Be on time because of you. Because of you, because of your love, because of your mind. No more pain, no more sadness, no more suffering, no more tears, no more sin, no more sickness, no injustice, no more death. Because of you, because of your love, because of your love, oh, our sins are washed away, and we can live forever, now we have this home, because of you. We are starting this new year with our brothers and sisters. What we wish for our one another is what we wish for ourselves, that in that day none of us will be left behind, but we will all enter that eternal rest where we can live beyond time, where there is no more sickness, there is no aging, there is no change, no boredom, no depression, no anxiety, no fear, but peace, eternal peace, eternal joy, eternal life. Let us press on. Let us never forget. That's what we are straining toward. Yeshua. Yeshua. There is joy everlasting. There is gladness. There is peace. There is wine ever flowing. There's a way. Yes. There's a feast. Because of you, because of you, because of your 